Good morning guys and this is Alfie the Foraging Hound talking to you. Today Peter will be hopefully getting this baby working and building a little open fire within it. Just playing around and just having some chill time in the woods. It's been a while and he has missed it so here we are. The weather for us little doggies is humid. So without further ado, Peter will be getting on with it while I look around. Alfie. Okie doke doggy. Oh, he will also be demonstrating his new stick that he made up. And working out whether it needs to be cut down or not. So without further ado, he's going to get on with building his fire. Well there you go, the fire pit is on its go, um, it's not a bad little beast actually, the fire has taken its time to get established partly because we've had torrential rain over the other day and everything is still a bit on the damp side, even the, the uh, standing wood is damp as well which makes life a little bit difficult but one must persevere and it does take a while for a fire to get established. And of course I can bathe in the wood smoke. Keeps the bloody mozzies away. Well, there you go, it's starting to get established now. I can start building a fire up. Ready to put the uh, screen across. Right. right, this fire pit thing that I've got, yeah, it comes with the one screen which is this one here. Because primarily this is designed as a barbecue. But I won't be using it, I'll be using this because it fits diagonally and it means I can still feed wood into it. Uh, this is an old um, pot stand for a fire that I've had for a while now. Um, it's not bad and it should work well. Anyway, I want to get my brew on in a second. Now the fire is starting to really get established. I'm quite pleased with the way it's working. And, well, guys, there you go. Anyway, I'll just see you in a bit. Right guys, down there I've got Inokia fungi. If I pick one out. Um, you pick these at your local supermarket. They're very nice, they're Japanese fungi. Uh, white pudding and some halloumi cheese and a couple of duck eggs. Um, so far this has performed quite well this fire pick. I'm going to have to feed a bit more wood into it. Um, great. But anyway, I'm going to get on with cooking my breakfast and once I've got this done I'll come back to you guys. It's quite a nice day. Humid but nice. Well guys, uh, I've got a new one of these. Um, I've got to uh, light my fire set like this, but it's triangular. Um, this is a Primus one, it's oval, so it fits better in the pack. And to be honest, the only reason that I bought this, I've left all the other bits at home by the way, you get uh, two sort of cups and a chopping board and what have you and a spork and um, one of them which is the salt and pepper pot and an oil pot. The only reason why I bought it is so that fits inside it. Um, I suppose I could have carved a shorter spoon but I quite like using this one. Uh, it's a piece of birch. Um, it's been a while since I've carved actually. Um, I must get down to doing it again sometime. It's uh, an enjoyable pastime. Right. Well, I was going to have an egg with this lot, but I think I'm going to give the eggs a miss because there's a lot here. And I've got some bread. Uh, anyway, bon appetit. Oh, there it is, guys. Superb, good piece of kit this. Nine out of ten. The reason why it's nine because I think it could have done with a slightly different grill top, which the you've seen it earlier. But then it's a Miami thing. Well, I built up the fire a bit because it's keeping the uh, mosquitoes down. Um, if I use a Trangia or the Primus, 
Um, you get your meal, but you also get fed upon as well. You know, I'd have been, I'd about half a dozen bites the last time I'd come out here, and I'd put on quite a bit of a ultrathon, but I hadn't put it down the legs, or and I got a bit down there, and actually I got a bit twice on the face as well. Um, but at least they, you know they're biting you, you know, you feel that sharp stabbing pain. Whereas ticks, very cunning. You might hear a feel of feathery crawl up your leg or wherever behind your ear, but when they dig in, they use an antiseptic. Um, well, no, use a, uh, not an antiseptic, uh, well, something to another to Nullify the pain. Whew. Anyway, I'm, in, I'm going to end up being kippered if I'm not careful. Fire's coming up well. Um, really good little fire pit. This uh, I gave it a nine out of ten for a couple of reasons. I, um, the grill, but then again, it is designed as a barbecue rather than a wood burning stove. But I've modified that. I've got one grill, and I might find see if I can find an old shopping basket and make another one. So it fits diagonally across, so you've got somewhere to feed the wood in. Um, the only other disadvantage with this is the weight. It weighs a lot heavier than the honey stove that I use. Um, the honey stove. Excuse me. Just get me brute. The honey stove is a great little piece of kit. It's a bit of a pain to put together at times, particularly if your hands are a bit cold. I've got both the honey stove and I've got the uh, the two panel extension which makes it into the hive, which is makes it that much bigger. The height of the honey stove is just right for putting, either using my Woodlord trivet to use as a pot stand or slip it underneath the um, griddle. But the trouble with the honey stove is that the bottom of the bottom plate is that far off the ground and you need an ash pan for the bottom because it gets incredibly hot underneath that honey stove. As it does underneath here, this gets warm, but it hasn't burnt into the ground. The ground is just warm, which is great. You know, you get little bits of ash falling through, but there's no embers as such. Um, also the honey stove folds flatter than this does, you know, it takes up less room in your backpack. Um, in fact, if you're very lucky and you've got a big enough billy can, it can actually slide into the billy can. Um, can't really fault, fault both of them really, I mean, you both have their advantages and disadvantages, mostly to do with the weight. Um, that's it, on, that's it on the stove, excuse me. Uh, uh, I had a nice breakfast as you saw, I had halloumi cheese, white pudding which is almost akin to an Irish haggis, it's really nice, very oaty and it's great, it's a, it's a nice thing to eat and it really, it's one of them, it's, it's one of them, it's, it sticks to you, you get a lot of energy from it and a lot of, uh, and a lot of feeling of satisfaction after you're eating it and Enochia fungi, which are like, as you saw, um, almost like spaghetti they are when they cook up, really tasty. I did bring a couple of eggs and some bread out with me, but that was enough for this morning. I'm not going to be doing anything heavy. Um, so, what's been happening in my little world? Well, we've just had the Olympics and to my mind it's, it's the best ever Olympics I've ever seen. We won lots of medals, we come third in the medal table and my, my particular favourite sport is the cycling, both the road and the track. Um, partly because when I was younger, in my twenties, I used to road race and time trial, which I enjoyed immensely. Um, had I started younger, when I was about ten, maybe I could have gone up to Olympic standard, who knows, but I, I lacked focus, you know. I went out to enjoy the racing, you know. Time trialing is great because it's a race against you. You know, you say you did a a ten mile in twenty minutes last time. You try and shave a few seconds off. You know, 
and you know you can't control the weather you can't control the conditions but you can control yourself and it's really good as I say excellent excellent and I hope it inspires many people around the world for Rio and what happens there um, and it's great even for the also rents because without the people that lose there will be no competition anyway I've been reading some books on my Kindle uh, one I'm gonna have to look up and in the next video I shall let you know I think it's by a guy called Angia and it's it's a I think he was an ex Mountie or it's certainly something in Canada and it's basically a, a, a survival bushcrafty type book very very good information in there a lot of it's not pertinent to the uh, UK because obviously you've got the you've got the wide expanse of environments within Canada and the US and you have a lot of water particularly in Canada and you have desert in the US but it was really good reading and you know some of these tips and tips and tricks were really good particularly on the uh, what to carry in a survival situation um, what do you carry in a survival situation? It's what's ever in your pocket at the time. You know, you're on a plane, you've got no knife, nothing. You've got to use that. But anyway, we've gone over this ground lots, lots of times before. Um, what else is there? Oh yeah, I've just been reading the uh, 1950s edition of Scouting for Boys. I have the first edition, not a copy of the first edition, not, not actually the first edition but a copy of the first edition you know republished in its entirety including other bits um, to do with uh, other things anyway so very good read actually um does always i mean I've, it crossed my mind last time i read scouting for boys that we call it bushcraft but really we're just adult boy scouts we go out we play in the woods i think someone some people have lost the plot when it comes to playing in the woods you know they take a shit well actually having said that shit loads of kit i've got a lot of kit with me today but i've got sort me have my tarp out it's it was in a pile in the living room and i thought well, i'd better get it folded up because it was beginning to look a mess um and it was just yeah, you know, as I say, I think we're just big boy scouts, really. There's an awful lot I've noticed of recent, of late. There's an awful lot of things on knives. Now, I've got what is fast becoming a very favourite knife. I've got a Mora 510, a Mora clipper. In fact, I've got two clippers. Um, I've got the. Ramian's Bushlaw knife, which is the uh, the budget version of his um, of his Woodlaw knife. Um, it's the same same steel, um, I would assume, but it's just hundred pounds cheaper because it doesn't have, as far as I can see, it just doesn't have the antler scales. It has oak scales at the moment, and I've got this one. This is fast becoming a favourite. Uh, it was made by my very good friend, who I've yet to meet, um, and we will be in a few weeks, Sandy. Look him up on Jack Law Knives or um, G G Zero, no QVW, I think. Um, I put it on. I put it on. I put his uh, channel name channel name underneath. Um, he's a radio amateur, um, and he's taken up. In the past he's done a lot of walking and he's taken up this thing we call bushcraft and he's recently started making knives and I was lucky to get one as a gift. Um, it's knife number eight in his series uh, and as he's gone on he's refined them. I mean this one hasn't got the, uh, hasn't been sanded in there but you know these later knives have been and he's made this the blade slightly slightly narrower so it's more more in line with actually the, the woodlaw knife 
And as regards knives goes, I've seen there's some other guys making knives, and they come up with all funny shapes. You know, I've seen the Tom Brown Tracker, and I've seen the Whisper K, I think it is, which is very similar. To me, they're not bushcraft knives. They're not knives built for working out in the woods. You want a, a simple bladed knife that can do all your things. There's another guy that's made a knife. He's an Eng he's an English guy, and he's decided to he's decided to make a knife. But what I, what I see happen as people evolve in making the knives, I ever end up looking like a Sami knife, where you've got the point come, you've got a straight top, and the point comes up like that. Or you've got the spear point knife like Ray's design. <coughs> um, people try and come up with a. They're trying to reinvent the wheel a lot of the times. And I think I could hear rain. Anyway, they're trying to reinvent the wheel. And a lot of the knives, to my mind, they just don't look right. They don't. They just don't look right. And in, if I was to hold it, I don't think they'd feel right. Another guy's made one that. It's like a, an esmeralda knife on steroids. You've got a really humpy bit at the back. The blade, the whole of the blade curves, so you haven't got a flat edge to the blade. And I don't think it'd be much cop from anything. It's just people get this idea of all. Oh, well. But then again, that's my opinion. Most times you end up using the same sort of knife every time. And when you look at what the indigenous people around the world use. Their knives are very similar to the knives that I use. Um, oh, I made my uh, stick, and in fact, what I'm going to do is we'll finish doing the smoking stave. I might cut it down a bit, a little bit on the long side. And basically, I want to show you the business end, which is a big S hook. Now, the reason for this is I intend to take it when I eventually get the canoe out in the water, which seems to be disappearing fast down the road. Uh, I'm going to use it as a type of boat hook. Uh, also, um, a foraging hook. You can there's often fruits and that way out of reaching the trees. You need to hook them down, so it's great for that. Um, great for putting. You got this hook here coat hook, stand this up against the tree, hang your hook on it, hang your coat on it. That's also good for hooking roping and cordage, that's a little bit out of reach. And great if you're going through undergrowth and you need to push vegetation out of the way. Um, I think it works quite well. Um, obviously ubiquitous paracord I've whipped it on with and I think it works quite well. It's a nice, it's actually ended up being a nice stave. It's dry now, it's a lot lighter than it was uh, a week or so ago and what I'm going to do is um, unbottle the linseed oil and white spirit and coat it and I've got to try and sort the end out I might bevel the end off a little bit and make a cap um, and that's it uh, there's not much else to tell uh, finally got round to doing some silver work only one day um, my other passion is I, I try and make jewellery I love and it's just trying to get into that again. Um, I must admit, as I come home from work every day, some days are just full on. And I mean, you know, it's, I come home, sit down. <sighs> but other than that, there's not a lot, not a lot else happening. Um, I'm looking forward to the meet up with uh, three great guys, um, swap ideas, have a bit of a cook up for a couple of days in the woods. Um, Pass on, swap ideas, pass on experiences. No. Uh, though I don't want it to be a beer fest, I might just take myself one bottle out. Um, it's nice to neck a, neck a bit of malted hop. Um, whether it's going to be a local brew from around here, which is Shepherd and Eam, or actually I've just discovered um, a Belgian beer called Leffe. Leffe, Leffe. Um, great. They've uh, had the blonde version and the brown version, and they're very nice beers. Nice price as well. Um, but other than that, guys, 
what else can I say? It's just get out there, do your thing out in the woods, out in the fields, out in the moors, up in the highlands of Scotland, the Lake District, wherever you live. The opportunities to enjoy what we do is great. Um, we often sit back and bemoan that we lose a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, and to my friends around the world, actually, uh, I'd love to hear your experiences of your local area because obviously where I live here, it's um, English woodland. Uh, it's quite mixed where I am at the moment. I've got some holly. There's a lot of uh, Scots pine around. Oh, oh, it's an old plantation pine. Uh, there's a sweet chestnut, oak, birch, some rhododendrons and laurel, lots of bracken <coughs> and some beech. Uh, I've seen some little bits of fungi popping up. has been damp of late. And it's great. What I'd like to hear, and this is this is a this is a bit of a video challenge, and I do apologise to you guys who who I subscribe to. I haven't I've been having a lot of trouble keeping up with the videos because yeah, you know, the heat lately just knocks you out, and of course the Olympics. I was hooked into that. Um, the challenge is, and it's it's just a video challenge, particularly to my friends in Scandinavia, North American continent. Uh, Canada and North America and mainland Europe let's have a a little bit of a tour around your area you know what makes your area different to my part of the world my part of the world I, I live in southeast England it's it's a beautiful part of the world in my book um, we, it's not like the highlands of Scotland where it can be a bit barren, you know, you don't get many trees. And the same with the upper parts of the Lake District or parts of Dartmoor. I live in some of the most densely wooded parts of the country, also most densely populated, which is a bit bit weird. But yeah, it's most densely part, wooded part of the country in the southeast of England. Um, a lot of coppicing, a lot of it is uh, basically factory woodland um, for use for other things. And, it's great. Uh, we've got chalk downland, and we've got the weald. Now, I'll be doing a video on my area. Um, maybe take the take the camera out, go further afield to show you why I like this area and what it means to me. But the challenge to you lot out there is your area. Why is it different to say Canada or? southeast of England or Germany and you know a little bit on the vegetation on the wildlife and on the trees um, and that's it have a good time guys and be safe be good and enjoy the outdoors